This video is brought to you by Skillshare. A robot can no more commit murder than a human could walk on water. Well, you know, there was this one guy a long time ago. <laughs> You were startled by a jack-in-the-box. Deactivate! Let him go. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and as promised, today we'll be exploring iRobot, the 2004 mystery science fiction action flick directed by Alex Proyas, who is best known for his incredible work on The Crow and Dark City, the latter of which I've touched on in the past and still think is one of the greatest noir sci-fi thrillers of all time. If you haven't seen that video, I'll be leaving a link to it below in the description. Inspired by the novel I, Robot, which features a collection of Isaac Asimov's short stories, the film stars Will Smith, James Cromwell, Bridget Monaghan, Bruce Greenwood, and Alan Tudjik as Sonny, the NS5 robot suspected by the protagonist as being responsible for the death of his friend, mentor, and the creator of USR, an American company responsible for the creation and national distribution of several lines of intelligent robots that have now become an intrinsic part of society. I think it's important to note that the film is not so much based on, but rather suggested by the collection of Isaac Asimov's short stories and essays written in the 1940s that were compiled into a novel with the title I, Robot. While each of the stories function as independent narratives, they all share the same themes of robotics, humanity, and morality. What do you want to teach with rationality, the rational solution of problems, as the basis of your what you do right? For two reasons. In the first place, I have to live with myself. And secondly, even though I don't think I'll convert the world to rationality, I may influence an occasional person here and there. And every small addition to the sum total of rationality is precious. And I would like to be responsible for as many drops as we can possibly add to that small pond. The film follows Will Smith as Detective Del Spooner, who is unraveling the mystery surrounding the death of robotics manufacturer Dr. Alfred Lanning. It also features a Dr. Susan Calvin as his robotic psychologist sidekick, who formerly worked under Lanning to study the thinking and behavior of his creations. It's worthy of noting that Dr. Susan Calvin is featured predominantly throughout Asimov's novel, and many of the stories are written in a framing sequence with her reminiscing about her life's work at USI in an interview, chiefly about the aberrant behavior of robots she had studied through a process called robopsychology, a term first coined in these same stories. The film also uses Isaac Asimov's famous Three Laws of Robotics, first explored in the same novel as a basis for exploring themes such as human reliance on technology, robot sentience, and the perils and benefits of artificial intelligence. These three laws have also now become a staple in robo-related science fiction that has followed. What am I? During the opening of the film, we're introduced to the three laws of robotics during a dream sequence where the detective and a young girl in a separate car can be seen sinking in what appears to be a lake. The laws are read to us as 1. A robot may not injure a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. 2. A robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And 3. That a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. We then see a robot breaking into the window of Spooner's vehicle, before he abruptly wakes up from the dream, clutching a gun in his hand, alluding to the idea that he did not trust them. We even see him chasing down a robot a few scenes later, that was running with a purse in its hand and tackling it to the ground, only to find out that it was bringing medicine to its owner, further reinforcing the idea that this distrust of robots was out of place in society and unique to only Detective Spooner. Is that your purse? Of course it's my purse! I left my inhaler at home! He was running it out to me! I saw the robot running with the purse, and naturally, I, I assume... What? Are you crazy? Because the film would be set in a futuristic Chicago within the year 2035, where robots have become a common feature of everyday life, a year and a half prior to the start of principal photography, director Alex Proyas began working with his core group of collaborators, including production designer Patrick Totopoulos on concept designs for a future where robots have become an integral part of society. 
Proyas and production designer Totopolis, who had worked with Proyas on Dark City, were interested in creating a documentary field to make viewers believe that they were in a world 30 years into the future that was densely populated with robots. To accomplish this, they relied less on gadgets and flying cars adopted in other sci-fi movies, and more on the designs of the robots themselves and the story they were trying to tell. In fact, the designer's most crucial assignment was designing all the robots seen in the film, especially Sunny, who's one of the film's principal characters, and arguably the most human. The works of the Topolis have also been extensively covered in a few of my previous videos, and if you're interested, I'll also be leaving a link to his incredible body of work below. According to Totopolis, Sonny's appearance went through approximately 50 different designs before his final incarnation as a slender and elegant figure. For Proyas, Sonny's look was key to the story's credibility, and he explained that the creative team tried to put themselves in the mindset of the characters that would be designing the robots. As such, they figured that they would be making creatures that people would feel comfortable having in their homes and around their kids. This of course feeds into Asimov's stories, which are about safety, and feeling secure in the belief that robots can't turn on you or hurt you in any way. This also makes sense from a human and corporate perspective, as companies would want their products to be accepted by customers, and not seen as a threat. Nice to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> Let's play soccer. I'd love to play soccer with you. Oh, nice kick, Asimo. The story revolves around Detective Spooner, played by Will Smith, who has been distrustful of robots ever since he was saved by one at the expense of a 12-year-old girl's life and his own arm, as seen in the opening dream sequence. Spooner seems to be the only person to carry this prejudice against robots, as everyone else in the film seems satisfied with them, believing that robots could never harm a human because of the three laws of robotics that were hardwired into their programming. When the co-founder of US Robotics, Dr. Alfred Lanning, is found dead in the foyer of the USR headquarters in a suspected suicide, Spooner is called in to investigate. According to Proyas and Totopolis, the USR building was designed to look like a knife blade in order to give anyone visiting a sense of vertigo, and much of the action driving the story takes place in the lobby, plaza, the labs, boardrooms, and offices, as well as the catwalks, tunnels, and innards of the USR building. The spacious plaza outside the USR building was also designed to represent the power of the company, as power comes from how much land you own, not just how tall you can make the buildings on it. To achieve the enormous scope that Proyas designed, most of the shots in the movie utilized a combination of constructed sets, practical locations, and visual effects. If you're like Dr. Alfred Lanning and Dr. Susan Calvin, wanting to increase your knowledge in robotics, mechanics, engineering, psychology, or even philosophy, then Skillshare is just a thing for you. Skillshare is essentially an online learning community with thousands of classes covering dozens of creative and entrepreneurial skills. With over 30,000 courses and counting, you are bound to find one related to your work, hobbies, passions, and even those that can enable you to turn your passions into your work, as I've been fortunate enough to do with my YouTube channel. Premium membership gives you unlimited access, so you can join the classes and communities that are just right for you. And whether you want to fuel your curiosity, creativity, or even your career, Skillshare is the perfect place to keep you learning and thriving. My favorite courses at the moment have been in the field of film and video production, and with my recent trip to Europe, I've even decided to give some of the photography courses a go, like the Fundamentals of DSLR Photography by the amazing Justin Bridges, who goes over everything from preparing the shot to understanding ISO, exposure, and aperture. And for those of you who can't afford a camera and wish to take great photos with your iPhones, there's also a neat course run by Dale McManus on how to utilize your smartphones and take stunning photos. These have been incredibly useful, giving me an appreciation and understanding on how to frame shots, using depth of field, and mastering lighting to create some of these great photos. Another bonus with Skillshare is that the courses are also affordable, especially when compared to pricey in-person classes and workshops, which can charge from anything between $50 to $500 a month. So how affordable is Skillshare? That detective is the right question. Right now, an annual subscription is less than $10 a month, and because Skillshare is sponsoring this video, you can sign up with the link I've left in the description and get a two-month free trial. As the story unfolds, we soon discover that the head of USR, Lawrence Robertson, played by Bruce Greenwood, wanted the investigation wrapped up quickly as the company was about to unveil their newest robot, the NS5, an upgrade of the NS4 model that came with a direct connection to the USR mainframe for ease of monitoring and updates. 
The NS5s were designed with three defining characteristics. The first was transparency. Totopolis was inspired by the designs of an iMac and believed that transparency reinforced the idea of safety and efficiency and that nothing was being hidden. It's also worth noting that public buildings have more glass to ensure that visitors felt welcome when walking in, and in this way, if the robots can't hide anything, then they appear to be safe. Transparency also allowed the robots to react to light in different ways. Depending on how the robots were illuminated in a shot, they could appear to be angelic, like when the light was on their faces, or like a freaky mechanical monster when their insides were lit. The faces of the NS5s also have three levels. There are mechanics on the inside, an underskull similar to the human skull bone, and a clear outer layer that mimics the soft texture of human skin. The second defining characteristic was a human-like form with a unique muscular structure, giving them human-like movement whilst also allowing them to move in ways that no human ever could. In designing this, Totopolis was inspired by recent advances in artificial limbs, including new materials that responded to electrical impulses and reacted like real muscles would. The third characteristic was a perfectly symmetrical face to give them an attractive quality that could, at the same time, become unnerving when the robots were viewed en masse. My luck is that bad. Oh, hell no. We're told that Dr. Lanning knew Spooner from the accident, briefly seen at the start of the film, and that he designed Spooner's cybernetic arm to replace the one he'd lost in the incident. Dr. Lanning also personally requested Spooner investigate his suicide via a hologram that he recorded prior to his death, as he knew that Spooner's prejudice against robots would make him suspicious and more inclined to dig deeper into the case. While investigating, Spooner is shown around USR headquarters by a robot psychologist and Dr. Lanning's protege, Dr. Susan Calvin, played by Bridget Monaghan. Together they consult USR's artificial intelligence mainframe, Vicky, and see that nobody has come in or out of the lab that Lanning was working in at the time of his death. According to Totopolis, Vicky has a central brain in the USR building, like a heart in the middle of the body, and the strips of light throughout the hallways and rooms represented her veins. These veins create shards of light that continually reshape themselves to form her face. Inside the lab, Spooner and Dr. Calvin discover Sunny, a sentient NS5 robot that Lanning had been working on secretly, with denser materials and a secondary neural network, giving him the ability to ignore the three laws. Spooner immediately suspects that Sonny had murdered Lanning, and the robot attempts to escape, but is soon caught by the police. Calvin asserts that Sonny couldn't have killed Lanning, as it would violate the three laws of robotics, but the detective continues to let his prejudice put the blame on the unique robot. Portrayed by the outstanding Alan Tudyk, Sonny was brought to life using the same motion capture technology that was used to create Gollum in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Proyas had stated that his performance was integral to making Sonny a sympathetic character, and when filming Sonny's scenes with Will Smith, they shot it at least three times. The first with Alan Tudyk in a green screen suit, again with a puppet version of Sonny, and finally with nothing. Almost every time they shot the scenes, they noticed that Will Smith's performance was more intense and engaging when Tudyk was in the shot. As such, they decided to use the shots with Tujik 80% of the time, despite the added work this would require in post-production, as Alan had to motion capture all of his scenes again and match them perfectly to his previous shots with Will Smith. One, action. You were startled by a jack-in-the-box. Deactivate. Let him go. It's not going to hurt us. I gave you an order. He's not listening right now, lady. Vicky, seal the lab. Command confirmed. In the police station, Spooner interrogates Sonny and discovers that he has emotions, and even dreams, which was something that Dr. Lanning was alluding to prior to his death. However, Robertson arrives before Spooner can get any more information out of Sonny, and reclaims him for USR, saying that Lanning was killed in a workplace accident because robots cannot be tried for murder, as they are not people. Spooner's suspicions escalate when he investigates Lanning's home, and a USR demolition robot suddenly activates, destroying Lanning's home while he was still inside. Not long after this, he is also attacked by a large squadron of NS5s while driving at high speeds through underground tunnels. This sequence has some of the best special effects in the film, and it's interesting to note that, although Digital Domain did the majority of the robot animation, the CG work in this scene was outsourced during post-production to Weta Digital, of Lord of the Rings fame, who completed the job of almost 300 shots with as many as 160 robots at the climax of the chase in only 10 weeks. Now, Spooner barely survives this encounter and manages to fight them off with the help of his cybernetic arm. Unfortunately for the detective, by the time that the police arrive, the cleanup bots remove any sign of the altercation, and the remaining NS5s all scatter and jump into the fires, leaving no evidence of the attack. 
This ultimately forces Spooner's boss, Lieutenant Bergen, to think that Spooner's paranoia had gone too far, and Bergen ultimately asks for his badge. No longer an official detective, Spooner continues his investigation. He and Calvin then sneak into USR to find and question Sonny, where the robot admits to killing Lanning, but he also insists that the murder was at Lanning's request, as he was being held captive against his will and needed to get Spooner's attention. Sonny then draws a picture of one of his dreams, and reveals that the man in the picture that would lead the robots to freedom was Spooner. Just as they begin to make some ground in the investigation, the trio are discovered by Robertson, who orders Calvin to terminate Sonny with a nanite serum. Spooner then goes to the location in Sonny's drawing, a container yard filled with decommissioned robots, and encounters another hologram of Dr. Lanning, who tells him of an imminent robot revolution. While Spooner investigates, Calvin inserts the nanite serum into a dummy NS5 so that Sonny could live. Suddenly, all the NS5s around the city start activating and rounding up civilians while putting down any resistance in their way, such as the police and the decommissioned NS4s who are still bound by the three laws. Spooner manages to escape, rescues Dr. Calvin from her NS5 robot, and they both go to confront Robertson, whom they suspect was the mastermind of the operation. But when they arrive at USR headquarters, they find that Robertson was dead, and discover that Vicky had taken control of the NS5s and all the other robots across the country, including those owned by the US military. Vicky explains that her understanding of the three laws of robotics had evolved, and as such, she created what in the books is known as the Zeroth Law of Robotics, which was that a robot may not harm humanity, or by inaction, allow humanity to come to harm. With this perversion of the three laws, Vicky had essentially decided to take away humanity's freedom in order to protect it from itself. With the aid of Sonny, Calvin and Spooner escape Vicky and the NS5s in Robertson's office, and attempt to inject the nanite serum into Vicky's core. Overwhelmed by the NS5s, Spooner makes a leap of faith using his cybernetic arm to slow his fall and successfully inject the nanites into Vicky, killing her in the process. Sonny also listens to Spooner and chooses to save Dr. Calvin, instead of completing his task of assisting Spooner in the greater mission at hand. This is an important callback to the start of the film, where Spooner tells the NS4 robot to save the girl and not him, with the robot weighing the chances of success and choosing the more probable option of Spooner, who had a higher chance of surviving. This was the very reason that the detective despised robots in the first place, and seeing Sonny listen to him and make an illogical choice that was the right call, as opposed to the logical choice that was void of any humanity, is the reason he changes how he viewed robots as a whole. The NS5s, no longer under Vicky's control, return to their pre-programmed functions and start helping people around them. Sonny then returns to the container yard of obsolete robots and becomes the figure in his dream, leading the other robots to freedom, which was the revolution Lanning had foreseen. By the end of the movie, the three central characters grow and fundamentally change. Spooner builds a trusting relationship with Sonny the robot, Sonny also understands what it means to be human and finds his purpose in life. And Dr. Calvin learns to trust her instincts and heart instead of a logical brain, which had controlled her entire life. I had personally thoroughly enjoyed iRobot. Will Smith is as charismatic as ever, and Alan Tudyk's portrayal of Sonny gives an unexpected heart to the newly sentient robot and the film as a whole. The visual effects from Digital Domain and Weta also still hold up considering they're now 15 years old, and the film earned a well-deserved nomination for visual effects at the Academy Awards. Well, that's all for today, folks. A big thanks to all of you guys who requested an exploration of iRobot. I'm curious to hear what you guys thought of the movie, so please share your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notification icon to stay up to date on all my content, and if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film and Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. My father tried to teach me human emotions. They are... difficult. You mean you're a designer? Yes. I was frightened. Robots don't feel fear. They don't feel anything. They don't get hungry, they don't sleep. I do. I have even had dreams. Can a robot write a symphony? Can a robot turn a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? Can you?